Welcome to Caffeinated Flicks. I'm Celeste. And I'm Kenzie. We're two chicks who drink coffee and celebrate flicks from diverse directors. If you like what you're hearing so far, take a moment to follow us in your favorite podcasting app. And give us a rating or review. Here's the show. So how are you? I'm good. I'm sad to report <laughs> that I've temporarily given up caffeine. <laughs> Why? Tell me more. Because last week I was just, I was feeling super off and I hadn't been sleeping good. Okay. And also I had been drinking a lot of coffee to the point where I've noticed that like it's made me really anxious and even jittery. Like I've gotten to that point apparently. And Aww. so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take like a wee little break. And I did it over the holiday break because I heard people say, if you ever cut back on caffeine, cut it out completely, you'll for sure experience with. <laughs> and she's, and they're like, it's pretty bad. So do it on a weekend. So you're not at work. <laughs> so I did, everything was fine. But then the second or third day, oh my God, I had a massive headache. Oh, oh I'm like, sorry. Oh my gosh. No, I'm sorry. I was thinking of you. Oh my God, Kenzie deals with these like all the time. Oh my God, it's awful. This is hell. <laughs> but back to that, it was fine. And honestly, the first day I cut it off, I've been sleeping amazing. Oh, well, that's good. Yes. It's easy to get up. I don't experience any crashes during the day or I get tired. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> I actually feel better. You're like, how dare this actually work? I know. I told my mom about it. She's like, oh my God, I've done that before too. And I'm like, how'd you like it? She's like, oh, I felt amazing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you can do it again. She's like, no. To be fair, like, I have to go on caffeine reprieves every so often when my migraines are just stupid bad because mm -hmm. caffeine actually, like, triggers my migraines or enhances them. So, yeah. Oh there, I've, I did some research one time. I was like, okay, how long do you have to go without caffeine until it's no longer in your system? And it said something like nine to 10 days. So I did go off of my, off of caffeine for nine to 10 days and it didn't help my migraines. Like it doesn't necessarily hurt my migraines or it doesn't really add to it if I go without it. But if I drink too much caffeine, then it'll trigger a migraine. So I have to be very, careful with my caffeine intake. I don't really go and get more than two drinks a day now. I'm sad. I know. Isn't it sad? <laughs> it's so sad. So are you just drinking herbal teas now? I have. So someone suggested dandelion root herbal tea. Yeah. Have you had it and you don't like it? Well, so I can see why they suggested okay. it because it's, it's a, it's a black tea, but it has a cough. It's bitter. And I think yeah. that's why it has that coffee-ish like taste, which I can see. Obviously, it does not taste like coffee. Right. But I like it. And so that's what I've been drinking. Mm -hmm. So are you not eating any chocolate either? Is there caffeine in chocolate? What? Uh -huh. <laughs> There's caffeine in chocolate. Oh, I'm not a I'm not a sweets person, so I don't really Lucky. keep it in the house. I Lucky. do have cacao. I've had cacao smoothies. And then last week I had a hot chocolate. But I didn't know there was caffeine in chocolate. Yeah, but there's caffeine normally, in chocolate. Yeah, I don't normally consume chocolate, so I didn't think about it. Well, yeah, nice. No, <laughs> no, we'll go back on chocolate. <laughs> and you're like, it's not because I'm trying to cut out sugar or anything. It's just oh, I'm trying to cut out caffeine. I oh. know. Oh no, I can't do that. <laughs> Let's not get crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's too too there's funny. So many things I can cut out of my diet. I don't eat meat. I'm not doing caffeine. <laughs> it's not caffeine. right. Here I come tonight. I have that same sentiment. I'm like, no, this is just going to be like, I'm, I'm too healthy. If I try and cut out everything, you know, so I gotta, I gotta throw in a couple of things that have the risk of killing me because I do not want to live until I'm 80. That just does not sound fun. It does not. Also, I don't want to be miserable. I want to <laughs> enjoy as much as possible right now. Exactly. <laughs> Let me live my life, damn it. <laughs> as best as I can until we can't anymore. Right? These are hard times. <laughs> well, I'm I have a bittersweet feelings for you about your no caffeine. <laughs> Thanks. It's only like temporary. And then I might do I might treat myself to a matcha 
every once in a while and like maybe like decaf latte or something like that but mm -hmm. since i know those still have caffeine in them but yeah. it'll just be like a cup back because i do feel better it makes me miserable that <laughs> i do i'm miserable and yet i still feel better i know it's so annoying you know i'm like people are like oh you should eat better and get more exercise you'll feel better and, and oh man it actually works so stupid <laughs> <laughs> oh my so did you have anything today did you have your dandelion tea today i did yes so i had that and then i put a little honey in it and then uh, a splash of almond milk and it was perfect it was delicious there you go, there you go. i know what did you have <laughs> this morning i had some homemade cold brew but right now i'm drinking a vanilla pie with some ginger and some honey because uh, I'm not sure what the quality of my throat would be like otherwise. So we will see how this goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ugh, I'm so sorry. It was totally fine. For the most part, like it had only been my nose and it had only been sneezing. And then I decided to go watch some comedy. And so I was laughing and then I started coughing and then I couldn't stop coughing. And I was like, oh no, this is a bad, bad idea. Oh no, <laughs> I need to get out of here. <laughs> Best medicine, and yet, oops, nope. I might have ruined myself. <laughs> the tea it is, but Yay. it gives me another excuse to drink out of my Sasquatch mug, which I love so much. So, yes, I know it gives me an excuse to use like the 50 million mugs I have. And right, have <laughs> that's right. Why do you have so many mugs if you don't even like hot beverages? Because when my mom was staying with me. She's like a huge hot coffee tea drinker, so she okay. had all the mugs. <laughs> and then they stayed with me. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I am More souvenirs, so I'm forbidden from buying any more mugs or bringing any more mugs home. Um <laughs> Oh, Richard said no more. <laughs> yes. He said no more to hand towels and throw blankets. Oh, that too. <laughs> I'm not I need a either get rid of hand towels or kitchen towels if I'm going to get any more, but it's, some of them are getting old, but I, I just love them so much. And I just want all the Halloween ones. I do too. I want festive ones. I want different hand towels for different seasons. And then I like to change them out multiple times a week. It just seems sanitary. Um, I know, right? <laughs> and it's such a like cheap way to decorate the home. Right. So still staying festive to whatever season or holiday it is. Mm -hmm. I love them so much. <laughs> it makes me sad that I can't bring any more home. <laughs> one day. One day we'll get through it <laughs> together. <Yeah. laughs> the struggle. <laughs> Our lives are so hard. <laughs> I know. They are. <laughs> so... We get into our movie today. Yes, let's do it. All right. So today is Save the Last Dance from 2001. So by chance, do you have a history with this movie? I remember it being super popular. I, what? That's 2001. I think I was okay. like maybe elementary or junior high when it came out. But I just remember how popular it was. But I was never really big into it, honestly. <laughs> do you? Yeah, I was one of those people who was really big into it. I love this movie. Watched this movie dancer? a thousand times. Did it I make want to be a dancer? <laughs> and maybe want to be, yes. You know, like how people think of Step Up when they think of dance movies. Like this yeah. was the original Step Up for me. Yeah. Like I wanted to dance so much because of this movie. And I do every time I watch it. So <clears throat> today's movie was directed by Thomas Carter. Thomas Carter was born on July 17th in Austin, Texas. So he is a cancer, which I feel like is always an unfortunate astrological name. Um, I hate all cancers. Do they? Oh, well, that's so sad. I feel like people always hate on like Scorpios or Virgos, I think, you know, but friend of the pod kebby fly who was with us for our love and basketball episode is also a cancer so <laughs> shout out to cancer <laughs> everywhere yeah hopefully you're not too crabby um <laughs> thomas carter was also a director and producer who is known for movies such as coach carter 
no relation, I'm sure, Equal Justice from 1990, and this movie, Save the Last Dance. He is a three-time winner of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Emmy Award, and he got his start by playing bit parts on series such as MASH, Lou Grant and Hill Street Blues, and a regular on the The White Shadow from 1978 to 1980. So a lot of these movies or a lot of these TV shows, I don't actually know with the exception of I've heard of MASH. (laughs) I've heard of MASH too. I remember it was really popular, but I never saw it myself. Right. Yeah. I just, I'm pretty sure it is supposed to be a comedy about people in the Vietnam War, but that could be my millennialism showing. <laughs> I remember having something to do with the military. I don't know. Yeah. So that's it. That's, <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I always think of Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams when I think of MASH. And I know that's not the same, but still, it's what my brain goes to. Oh. So Carter got his knack for directing when he directed four episodes of The White Shadow. And this is actually what launched him into a direct career. And he's also been the recipient of the Pritis Directors Guild of America Award. And that is all that I found on, on Thomas Carter. There's not a whole lot in, for, in terms of his biography. Sometimes there's not. There have been a couple of directors that I've struggled to find information on. And I'm like, oh, I feel so bad because it looks like we're like, I know. we don't care. But I'm like, there's very little on the internet about them. <laughs> and I have scoured. I know, especially I had, if you haven't had anything, like, recently. Mm-hmm. Like, what they're known for is much older movies, so we try. Right. For sure. <laughs> we definitely do try. We scour the internet as best as we know how to find <laughs> information on their biographies. <laughs> so, Save the Last Dance has an iconic cast featuring the top build actors and actresses of Julia Stiles, Sean Patrick Thomas... Carrie Washington, and then some of our additional actors and actresses are Bianca Lawson, Vince Green, Elizabeth Owes, Fedro Starr, Garland Witt, and several others, but those are our main cast. And some fun facts about our cast. So this was Carrie Washington's first major role. At the time of this, she was actually working as a substitute teacher, and so she was paid so little for the film itself that she actually returned to that job. And after doing that, she switched from high school to elementary school because high school students would show up to her class wanting Chanel to teach them French. And Chanel is her character's name in this movie. (laughs) I was like, I can't really blame them, honestly. I love Chanel's character so much. (laughs) So at the time this movie was filmed, Kerry Washington was 22 years old, Julia Stiles was 19, and Sean Patrick Thomas, who plays Derek, was 31 years old. You know what? He looked older. <laughs> really? <laughs> this was just another... So African-American, he <laughs> looked like an older man. You could tell. I'm like, this guy looks mature. <laughs> I didn't get that. Mostly, I think I was back into the same problem that we had with Love and Basketball. I was just dumbstruck by uh, how attractive he is. So I'm just like, oh, okay, this is fine. <laughs> I, I can't help it. <laughs> so shall we get into the ratings? Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. All right, so I will do the 10 out of 10 titled Great Movie. This movie is one of the best movies I have ever seen. Not only is the soundtrack hot, the dancing and all that was dope as hell. (laughs) I don't think anyone else could have done it better than Julia Stiles. As for Sarah and Derek in the movie, I give mad props to that. Don't care about what people think. Do your thing. Peace out. I was not ready. (laughs) Oh, I'm cool. (laughs) I would have made it probably worse. So you're fine. (laughs) So with that, the one out of 10 is don't waste your money. You would think that with all the talented people at MTV, they could make make a much better movie than this. Don't waste your money on it. The script and the plot line are terrible. The plot is ter- totally not believable. She did a good job dancing. That's about it. Bye. Gosh. <laughs> I love when people give reviews and they end with a goodbye. 
<laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> <Half Asian. laughs> it's okay right <laughs> but yeah so once again i don't Here. believe this rating yeah but that's the nature of one out of tens <laughs> I feel like you know a movie's good when the one out of the one out of ten review still has something positive to say about it. Right. You know, they don't know what they're talking about that it is a really good movie. <laughs> so, I love it. Mm -hmm. So shall we get into it? Let's do it. Awesome popcorn. All right. So we open up Save the Last Dance with Sarah, played by Julia Stiles, on a train by herself. During this train ride, she has flashes back to the events that have led her to this moment. She used to dance ballet where she lived with her mom in Lamont. And we see her auditioning for Juilliard. She has this argument with her mom, which who apparently owns like a flower shop or something of that nature. But she has this argument with her mom saying that she absolutely has to be there at the audition. She has to promise to be there. And her mom's just like, Everybody's called out sick. I'm the only person who can do this right now. <laughs> so while her mom is driving to her audition, Sarah is on the stage and we see her mom speeding to get there, but die in a car accident. One a semi truck has skidded across the freeway and her car basically slams underneath it. We presume killing her instantly. Yeah. And there's a, there was a shot of her just like lying there. Yeah, blood on her forehead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she did not. Yeah, survive that. In the audition, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a callback, but flashback. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm like a callback, an audition callback. <laughs> you know, that is not the right word. It's the right word for theater in general, but <laughs> no, it's not that. She's recalling in a flashback that she messes up her audition and that's when she hears the news that her mother has died on the freeway by a state trooper and she collapses. So while she's on the train, a woman comes and she sits across from her and she notices that she's got like a ballet magazine and she's, Ooh, I always love ballet. Never had the body for it, but <laughs> I certainly love it. And then she asks Sarah, you know, do you dance? And Sarah's line that we'll hear throughout the movie is she used to dance, but not anymore. So when train stops, we see that Sarah's father, who has not been in her life up until now, picks her up from the train station. So we have found that she has moved from Lamont to Chicago and she's now going to move into the presumably two-bedroom apartment that he has in Chicago. When they get to the apartment, he's taking her around and he shows her the pull-up couch and there is the second room that has a broken door and the room itself was a little dilapidated. And at some point in time, he promises that this will be her room. And that it'll get all like a set. massive hole in the wall. There's like pieces of the wall just missing. <laughs> yes. Just that drywall is completely gone. And yeah. you can see like the bit, the boards behind it. <laughs> yeah. I told her, like, why wouldn't we like duct tape that? Like I can just imagine a rat or something crawling <laughs> out of there. <laughs> he does say this may not be what you're used to, but the water is hot and the mice are friendly. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like but I'll go. So you got that. I, I'm not sure if I can live with a potential for mice. Honestly, like I have dreams about it and it terrifies me. I'm just like, no, no, no. <laughs> I, that is like the one thing I'm afraid of. Like, I can hold snakes, I can get rid of bugs, I can get rid of cockroaches. Like, I love spiders, I love bats, all of that stuff. Like, none of that terrifies me. But the second you get a rodent smaller than a rabbit, I'm like, nope. Not having it. <laughs> Take it away. No guinea pigs? No guinea pigs. I think they're annoying. Oh. <laughs> I don't like their teeth. I don't like their teeth. I don't mind if they're in the cage as long as I don't have to hold them. I don't have to, like, be near them. Other people can have them. By all means, do it. It's just not for me. <laughs> no, thank you. Here, we know that she's obviously going to go to a new school. So he takes her to her first day of school, but... 
She's like, you don't have to come in with me. I know how to do this. And he's very reluctant. Now, meanwhile, she's also not referring to him as dad or father or anything of that nature. She just calls him by his first name, Roy. So yeah. I'm like, okay. That establishes that there's absolutely no relationship between you two. <laughs> he's almost like a stranger to you. Got it. <laughs> yeah, basically. So when she walks into the high school or up to it, she is a little culture shocked because this is a predominantly black high school where she was previously in an all white high school, really. And when she's entering the high school itself, each of the entrances has a metal detector that you would find in like the airport. <laughs> so she has to go through that. And she even sees a couple of the students being frisked for, you know, potentially having metal objects on them. So she's just taking it all in. She goes and she finds, I think, the principal or an assistant principal or some kind of school administrator. And the school administrator takes her to her first class. Here, if you've ever watched 10 Things I Hate About You, there will be a couple of parallels to it. So we've got a black teacher teaching English and they're talking about Capote. This is where he's asking, you know, what did we learn from Capote? What did we learn from this text? And she answers and she has her first heated argument with Derek over Capote's writing and some of the different themes in their writing that you'll find within Capote and James Baldwin and so on and so forth. So that's the end of that. And she's shut up from that. I put, it, put it in her place there. <laughs> yeah. This is it. <laughs> Which will happen throughout the movie itself. Yeah. We come from an all white lens, essentially. And you come into a situation where you get to the chance to learn about diversity and learn about different point of views of life you're going to get learned yeah, <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> so later in the hallway, Sarah puts her backpack on the floor and this is where she meets Chanel because Chanel walks up, takes her backpack. And just when Sarah turns around, Chanel tells her, don't put your shit on the floor. You'll be giving away to charity here. Yeah. <laughs> Chanel giving Sarah some sage advice. It's so funny because just as Sarah's about to be brave and introduce herself, Chanel is gone. She was out of there. She was uh, in and out. So now we're at lunchtime and it's walking around. She's about to go sit with Chanel and her friends during lunch, but then somebody else comes and sits down where she was going to. And then much like I said about 10 things I hate about you, she finds her way to a table that looks like the future MBAs of America with Bogie Lonestein. <laughs> if you've watched that movie, it's a hoot. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. So <laughs> Chanel comes and saves her from this table. And <laughs> what's funny is I can't remember what the, the gentleman calls her. I think he calls her Sierra or something like that. And she says, actually, it's Sarah. And Chanel's, yeah, it's Sarah. <laughs> and so she comes and picks her up from the table. Yeah, throughout the movie, people are constantly calling her other things. And she's Which Sarah's like, not a hard name. <laughs> right. But it, what was funny in the scene, when she first comes out with her lunch, she sees all white table. <laughs> so she sees a table with all the handful of non-African Americans there. And so she makes the conscious decision to not go and sit with them. <laughs> She's like, She's I'm like, not going to be that person. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, so then Chanel brings her back over to her table with her friends and just after Ch Chanel's done introducing her, uh, Sarah looks beyond Chanel and sees Derek and just says asshole <laughs> and Chanel's response is you're going to have to be a little bit more specific if you're going to make those kinds of claims and so Sarah says, oh, no, I'm just talking about the guy in the, the blue sweater behind you. And Chanel goes, are you talking about Derek Reynolds? And Sarah responds with, yeah, he thinks he's so cute and so smart. And Chanel says, yeah, I know him. He's my brother. And this causes Sarah to clam up real nice like. But then Chanel 
laughs it off and says, yo, it's fine. Don't worry about it. (laughs) What I thought, I'm like, because I was thinking back to their little debate in class. I'm like, what part of his behavior made him think that he was attractive? Well, maybe it was like, like that cockiness or something. Yeah, maybe, I guess. But I don't know if she necessarily meant like cute in the attractive way, though, like more so. And oh, look at how cool I am. Cute. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> I thought she was already just expressing her feelings. <laughs> you know, maybe she was. That's the great thing about art. It can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. Exactly. <laughs> so we go over to Derek's group now and we see this hanging out with some of his boys and Malachi comes over. We're introduced to Malachi and they discuss how Malachi was just released from juvie. So later on that evening, her dad is trying to connect with her and he invites her to his gig that night. (laughs) And he also shows her the freezer full of hungry man dinners that he (laughs) loves He's like, they've got everything you need. Animal, mineral, (laughs) plant. Yeah. (laughs) Do you remember those? I used to love frozen dinners. And now I look at them and I'm like, what the fudge was I eating? (laughs) Lots of sodium. That's what it was. I used to, I didn't eat the Hungry Man ones, but I used to eat kid cuisine like it was going out of style. Um, A little like cosmic brownie. or Yes. Yup. I used to love those. I think because there were so many colors in it, it was just so appealing. And the cute little penguin. Oh, my God. (laughs) He's still learning. Or um, I think it's the Marie calendars. They weren't exactly that. Marie calendars. That's good. Marie calendars. (laughs) Where you had your pizza pocket ones. You had your, like, nuggets and fries. (laughs) I used to love chicken pot pies. Oh my gosh. Those. Oh my god, those were my favorite. <laughs> I love that for you. I was never a pot pie person or like a soup person or anything with gravy, really. So for me, I was just like, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm very white. That's all. <laughs> I feel like chicken pot pie is like a, a traditionally white dish. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> yeah, like Richard loves. Loves, loves, loves chicken pot pie. He also loves Thanksgiving. And I think this is also like a Thanksgiving food. And I'm like, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I love chicken pot pies too. But I try to make some vegetarian ones. But mm-hmm. Billy doesn't like pie crust. So he won't really eat it. Yeah. I like pie crust. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I, I can't even. <laughs> Well, I'll make you some pot pies and then you can have some of those. So <laughs> let me get a great pot pie. For somebody who doesn't like pot pie, I make a great pot pie. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Yeah. So once again, Roy says, here, have some Hungry Man dinners. And she says, you know, my mom would never let me eat that. And after he invites her to his gig that night, she's Roy, it's a school night. <laughs> He's just, oh, oh yeah, that's right school yeah he's clearly not prepared to have a child well like a 17 year old daughter even you know and that's a whole nother issue as opposed to just a child (laughs) and i don't blame him the next day snooki who's one of chanel and Derek's friends the three of them are walking to school and snooki says that steps the local hip-hop club is going to be lit And this is where we also find out that Derek is waiting for his acceptance letter to Georgetown because he has dreams of becoming a doctor. So once they get to school, Sarah meets up with them and Chanel introduces them. But then she's like, oh, this is my brother, Derek. Oh, wait, y'all have met already. (laughs) Trying to be all cutesy. We continue on through the day and later in gym class, Diggy, who's one of Chanel's white friends, who thinks that she's down, but Chanel, you ain't down. You're fine. (laughs) She is struggling up the giant rope. Did you have to climb a rope? Did you in your ever have this kind of gym? Cl- yeah, I was just about to ask. No, I never had to climb a rope. They had a balance beam. Right? I know. What kind of gym was this? Like- <laughs> I did have to climb a rope when I was in elementary school, which I never did because I was horrible at it. But <laughs> that was elementary school. I Even in elementary school, I never had that. 
We did do gymnastics in elementary school, but there were no balance beams. It was all just the free for all of what we could do. Oh my God, I never had gymnastics. It was so hard. <laughs> I was so jealous because there were some girls that were clearly in gymnastics and they were out mm -hmm. here flipping, doing backflips and all these fancy cartwheels. And I'm like, here's my rule. Cause you... <laughs> <laughs> we I can do the part well for the long <laughs> last. <laughs> We're graded on. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. We're graded on that? Intense. Yep. I have questions. Yeah. I have questions. <laughs> I was watching gymnastics, but my parents always said that I was too tall for gymnastics, which I'm pretty sure was code for we don't have money for gymnastics. Oh. Well, I growing up in gymnastics. I was jelly of her. I was jealous of everybody. I was like, I didn't have. Girl Scouts, I didn't have gymnastics. <laughs> I had babysitting duties, so. That's what happens when you have siblings. <laughs> All right. So anyway, Chanel is doing a little bit on the balance beam. And then after Chanel is done, Sarah gets up onto the balance beam and does a little bit of her ballet moves. And of course, during this, Chanel, Nikki, and Diggy are looking at her like, damn. <laughs> What I love is afterwards in the locker room, Chanel asks Sarah, how do you get your leg to bend like that? <laughs> and this is where we hear Sarah say her number one line of, I used to dance ballet mostly, but I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. So Chanel says, oh, then you got to hit steps with us. And she's okay, sure. <laughs> where will I know where to go? And she's like, it's okay. You'll come by my house and we'll go from there together. So after school, Chanel tells Nookie that he needs to hook Sarah up with a fake ID. And Sarah gets the biggest dig on Snooky because he's sitting there and he's trying to say some kind of crap to her, you know, about how, what, you thought you were just going to get in on, I need some money in order to get your ID, like blah, 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 blah. And Sarah goes in with a, you talk a lot of shit for somebody who ain't saying anything. And then Chanel's like, oh. <laughs> That's just the movie every time. I know. <laughs> Which is sidelines. <laughs> Which is why all the high schoolers wanted to be taught French by her. <laughs> yeah. So Derek tells Sarah, you know, steps ain't no square dance. And Sarah replies with, That's okay. I don't dance in squares. I dance in circles, probably around you. So he's like, All right, all right, let's do this. So later on, we see Sarah meet up at Ch Chanel and Derek's house, and Sarah is introduced to Mama Dean and Chanel's son, Christopher, who's very cute. We're pretty sure that Mama Dean is like their grandparent or something. Yeah. Probably. Sarah stumbles over asking Nell if Christopher is hers, and Chanel just responds with, well, if he sure ain't Mama Dean's. While they're heading to the club, Sarah's just completely wigging out about her outfit. And she should be, honestly. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's from The Gap. <laughs> I love that part. So outside the club, Chanel asks one of her friends if she can just sit in her car for a minute while she helps make over Sarah. And so we get a little bit of a makeover montage, but not as much as you would see in a traditional like teenager movie. But she comes out with her her shirt, that she was wearing with a bunch of paisley print on it, now wrapped around her hair, and she's wearing, I'm trying to think of what it's called, a camisole underneath and a skirt and some really chunky boots. So she's got looks. a little pirate vibe going on because <laughs> her, her earrings. <laughs> just oh, her yes. <laughs> she gave her, her hoops. <laughs> yeah, her little hoops. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, I thought it was a cute outfit. So. I concur. I love that. We have the same water bottle. Yes. Yes, we do. We'll have <laughs> a smart water would like to advertise onto our podcast. That'd be great. So as they walk into the club, all of a sudden Chanel's ass gets grabbed. And so then she goes and she grabs back where she grabs the dude's dick. And she's, excuse me, how did I have it? And he's like, you got it, you got it. And she's like, that's right. That's how I thought I had it. I thought I had the right to walk into this club without being grabbed by your grummy ass hands. So she is not playing around is what we're learning. And Sarah is just shook, by the way, because she's yeah. 
again, a lot of culture shock going on. She's just, I can't believe this. I appreciate how she's game for it, though, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Kudos for that. <laughs> Not everybody would be. Yeah. So, here's where we formally meet who Nikki is, and she's just a class A bitch, really. Oh, yeah. So, we find out that Chanel and Nikki have beef because... Nikki used to date Derek, and Chanel does not appreciate how she played her brother Derek. Later on, Derek and Malachi show up, and as they're walking in, Nikki comes and she finds Derek, and he does not give her the time of day. So he's like, how did you think this was going to play out? And she says, you know, I miss you. And he's like, what happened to your current boo? And she's like, oh, I beat him off. And he responds with, so you fired me. You laid him off. Sounds like you're the problem. Mm -hmm. Nikki is gorgeous, but she does have that classic, like the perfect resting bitch face. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah, she's like, don't make me fuck up your shit. <laughs> like, Sarah and Chanel go to the bar. And while there, Chanel's ex and Christopher's father, Kenny, comes up. She asks him why he hasn't come to see his son in a while. And he's like, come on, you know that you came here to yell at me and to dance with me. So he convinces her to go out into the dance floor. And they're dancing to the song called Murder, She Wrote. And I don't know why the song is iconic for me. And I love this song. And it could just be like the dance moves paired with it. I don't know. But I love the song. It felt like a reggae hip hop feel to it. Mm -hmm. So Derek comes to Sarah and he gives her shit because she orders Chanel's drink, but then she says a beer, anything. And he's like, not anything. If you're going to get a beer, it should be the best beer there is. And she's like, whatever. And he's like, what does that mean, whatever? And she's like, whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> so he tells her, aren't I supposed to be dizzy by now? And she's like, oh, um, sure. She starts to get really hesitant and really nervous about dancing. But he eventually does bait her out onto the dance floor. And it's extremely obvious. She has absolutely no idea what she's doing. Yeah. <laughs> this scene was, was hard to watch. <laughs> it's great, but though. I she finally gets in her head. Okay, this is just a regular dance. I'm just going to watch his moves and mirror his footsteps. And so she does that until all of a sudden they crack heads together. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I remember that, you know, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so bad. But then I was like, if I were in her situation, I would look either just as awkward, if not worse. Oh, I love it. I love it. I do look that awkward. Sometimes when I do go out dancing, I'm like, okay, just so you know, I'm just pretending out here. I'm just doing my best. So <laughs> I may step on you. I can't promise that I won't. <laughs> A drink for encouragement is absolutely necessary when going dancing. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that's the best part <laughs> so while they're doing this nikki and her entourage notice and nikki is just peeved that he'd rather dance with sarah than dance with her then malachi being who malachi is as we will learn he likes to stir shit up and he sees a rival across the club and causes a fight to break out at this point in time Derek goes to help malachi out of the situation and all of a sudden it's time for everybody to go because the cops have been called. <laughs> Derek and Malachi beat it. Sarah, Chanel, and Diggy beat it, you know, and they all go their separate ways and Chanel's like, all right, where's my brother? Where's my brother? And so they finally all meet up and Sarah's getting really uncomfortable now. She's like, uh, you know what, guys? I live about five blocks out. I'm going to go ahead and head out myself. And Chanel's like, no, you don't. No, you're not doing this alone. There are too many boys trying to think that they're men. <laughs> like, no. And so Derek offers to walk her home. He says while thinking that if she wants to, he's happy to meet up with her after school to work on some of her moves. Once she gets inside of her apartment, she wakes up her dad and he surprises the hell out of her. And says that he was also surprised when he came home on his break to find that she was gone. 
And this is where he tries to insert his authority and says, you know what? If you're going to live here, you can go out. You can do whatever you want, but you got to let me know. And you got to be home at a reasonable time. And she's like, whatever. <laughs> Fair. That's a, I, like, that's a very lenient parent right there. I know, right? <laughs> It's like the bare minimum, just write a note. <laughs> so we cut to the next day after school when Eric and Sarah are having their first like dance lesson, essentially. And so he's trying to show her some moves, some basics of hip hop, including like how to walk, how to sit. And it's hilarious because she starts out in like a, uh, what is it called? A plie, plie or plie, plie? I don't know. I only took ballet for a month when I was 12 and I quit because I was with a bunch of six-year-olds because I had no training at all in ballet. They're like, okay, you're in your class. And of course the beginner class had a bunch of four and six-year-olds. Yeah. They start them very young. Yeah. I knew, and you have to. So <laughs> I was very awkward. So anyway, she starts in a starting ballet position. And he's like, what is this? What is this? And so he, he spreads her legs a little bit further out. <laughs> and he's like showing her some side to side movement, how to sit, chilling. And it's just a very humorous scene. So Sarah asks Derek later on if he's always wanted to be a doctor. And he says, how did you find out? She's like, that's all anybody ever says about you. Everyone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Okay. Well, yeah, I've always wanted to be a pediatrician. And then very similar to when we did Poetic Justice, she asks him if he has any kids. <laughs> and he turns back to her and he's like, no, do you? <laughs> She's not trying to be smart, I swear. <laughs> so then at the end of their little training, uh, he pulls out a fun move where he does a spin and then he gets into a split and then she's like oh that's so cute and she pulls out some of her dance her ballet dance boot and spins around in a circle around him and then lifts her leg up behind him and then ballet walks away and he just looks at her and he's like what the hell is that <laughs> this is once again where we hear her say oh you know i used to dance ballet but i don't anymore <laughs> i used to i wonder if there were any like stunt doubles for their dance moves or if they actually learned them all themselves. You know, I wonder that too. According to the fun trivia that I got, so Julia Stiles actually did do a month and a half of dance training for six hours a day before she started filming. So she did do quite a bit of dancing. And after filming started, she continued to take choreography classes on the weekends. She did do a lot of the dance moves herself, but I always wonder about, especially the, the specific ballet moves, yeah. we're already sure that they would have had a stunt double come in for that. Yeah. So later on, Sarah is at home. She's chatting with her old best friend from Lamont about how slamming, you know, steps is, which is some more of that iconic 2000 early aughts slang, you know? <laughs> and she tells her friend, oh, you know, I met someone. And her friend says, wait, you got white guys at your school? <laughs> Sarah responds, no, actually. <laughs> I think this is like her best friend too, because she's yes. just constantly praying for her. I know. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Which is funny because we don't really ever get the sense that Sarah is religious at all either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people can be friends with religious people who are not religious themselves. That's true. <laughs> so we're back at school and Malachi is roughing up a girl in the women's restroom and Sarah walks in and she ends up distracting Malachi long enough for the other woman to get away. And because of this, Malachi gets angry and he threatens Sarah to not mess around where she's in, she shouldn't be, essentially. Wild. I know. So Malachi has a very specific image and he is very set in that way. Regardless of how many times other people have tried to tell him, you don't have to be this way. He's like, nope, this is what I am. This is what I got. Mm -hmm. So that's how it is. Later on, as Derek and Sarah are heading on to their next practice location, Sarah asks him, you know, why are you friends with him? He's scary. Like, you're not, but he is. And Derek tries to convince her that he's not really that bad of a guy. And this is also where we learn why Derek is so beholden to Malachi. He says that 
A while back, they got into some bad shit. They broke into a liquor store and cracked open the register. Somebody happened to see and called the 5 They split, and unfortunately, he went the wrong way, and the cops went after Derek. So Malachi smashed in some car windows and took the heat off of Derek. The DEA, when, you know, drilling Malachi, tried to give him any deal that he wanted in order to turn in Derek, but he didn't. So this is the reason why Derek is so beholden to him. He's just like, no matter what, he's really a good guy deep down. He's one of my best friends. You know, he could have turned me in for a Rolls Royce and everything, but he didn't. So Sarah's response to this is to tell that she once stole a hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the same thing. And especially even more so because her mom found out and made her give it back. So <laughs> have you ever stolen anything? Yeah, I think I mentioned it. I stole a hair tie. Because you stole I, a hair tie? Yeah, it was really hot. <laughs> we went, it was like, <laughs> my hair was down in the mall, and we went to, a, it was like a Claire's or yeah. something like, like one of those. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so hot. And so I, I stole a hair tie. <laughs> I'm just so scared, but. <laughs> it was so funny. What a hair tie. Oh, <laughs> That's oh, amazing. I stole a 24-pack of waters from Target. But that How did she do that? <laughs> because I never get waters at Target. And the one time I went, I needed them, like, a, on a random day. And so I stuck them on the bottom of the cart. And then when I went to go check out, I forgot about them. And I get to my car, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's fine. Like, I give them enough money. <laughs> Yeah, I think the only time I've ever stolen was a very similar situation. I had a purse that I was going to buy. Like, I had full intentions to buy it. I had it wrapped around my shoulder. I pay, I put everything onto the conveyor belt or whatever. And I had the purse still wrapped around my shoulder. I ended up walking out the store, not realizing that I hadn't paid for it. <laughs> Like, the clerks and everything, knew, like, saw the bag on me and didn't say anything. Wait, so you put a purse on and then you just uh -huh. left it on you while you were shopping? Yep. You just wanted yep. to see what it would feel like? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I was very attached to that purse. <laughs> Amazing. But that's right. cool. Same to, like, nice. purses are not cheap. <laughs> well, this one was. But <laughs> I'm not there. I'm not buying designer purses. I do not get paid enough to buy designer purses, and I wouldn't oh, know how to take care of one if I did. <laughs> I no, it doesn't seem worth it for me because it's so messy. Yeah. Even like non designer bags can get pretty pricey though. I know. Like the last purse that I bought that I'm so proud about was twelve dollars at the Burlington Coat Factory, and I'm like, I love this purse so much. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I know. I think I usually only buy purses if I find them on clearance or like, very discounted. Exactly. Yeah. That's pretty much how I live my life. <laughs> my clothes, jeans, anything over $12 is too much. How do you afford Target then? Mm -hmm. I mostly window shop. <laughs> oh, that's just you and all. You're not somebody yeah. who can pick up too many things. I love window oh. shopping. <laughs> so while Sarah and Derek are sitting at the bus stop, waiting for the bus so that way they can get to the next practice studio, Derek says, oh, how come you don't ever talk about your mom? Were you guys tight and shit? And she says, you know, yeah, we were. And so he continues to press about it. And she's like, gosh, she's dead. Can we stop talking about it? So she gets very defensive. And then he responds with, so are you and your dad tight and shit? And she's, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, we share the same DNA. Exactly. <laughs> oh. As tight as you can get. <laughs> Half of my chromosomes. <laughs> they head off to their new practice location. And here we get a really fun montage of Derek and Sarah practicing hip-hop moves. So it's very funny because this is where he teaches her how to grind, essentially. And she asks at one point in time, she's like, how's my butt? <laughs> and he's like, oh, it's nice. And he's like, no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's clear that they're starting to have feels for each other, you know? And especially when we cut to Sarah and Chanel's room, complimenting one of her fashion designs. And we learn that Chanel wants to go to design school. And then Sarah asks Chanel about their mom. And 
Apparently, their mom was under drugs, and after getting out of jail, she took off. Because of all the inquiry and time that she's been spending with Derek, Chanel accuses Sarah of liking Derek. And Sarah's only response is, no. <laughs> Very sheepishly. <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> so... Just at that time, we start to hear some hollering from across the that apartment, and we come in to see that Derek and Mama Dean are celebrating his acceptance letter into Georgetown. So everybody's so excited because this means that he's really on his way to living his dream and getting out of Chicago and really going for it, you know. Where is Georgetown? Old please. <laughs> My bad. I was just curious. I'm like, where is that? Washington, D.C. Oh, mm. that's exciting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know where a good chunk of the Ivy League schools are, mostly because of Gilmore Girls. <laughs> I was going to ask, I'm like, is Georgetown an Ivy League school? I'm pretty I'm, sure it is. I'm rewatching Gilmore Girls right now. I'm like, I don't think Rory's mentioned it. <laughs> well, and I think it's an Ivy League school for a specific studies, you know? Gotcha. So after this, we cut to Sarah and Sarah. <laughs> I've made their cute couple name. Um, <laughs> Sarah and Derek on a train and they're heading into the city and he's saying that he wants to surprise her with something, but she's like, why are you surprising me? This is your celebration. And he's like, just go with it. <laughs> At this point in time, they start to notice an older white woman across the way, staring at them directly and just glaring at them oh, yeah. throughout this whole interaction. <laughs> so Sarah turns to Derek, says, we've got an audience. Work with me here. So she starts to caress his face and rub him a little bit. And he starts to, you know, kiss her neck and they start to canoodle a little bit on the train I felt like it was starting to get heated there. I was like, well, oh. I was... <laughs> I'm like, y'all are still in public. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, like, if you weren't into somebody, how could you even think about doing this, you know? <laughs> like, no, no, we're really just friends, but we're going to sit here and make out just to yeah. have some fun with this woman over here. <laughs> Sarah ends up waving directly, making eye contact with this woman when Derek is straight up, like, making out with her neck. And the woman gets up, glares at them, and finds a new seat. <laughs> and they just bust out laughing. Mm, it was it. quite humorous. <laughs> After exiting the train, Sarah notices what Derek's surprise is. They come up to the Chicago Theater, and she sees the... What is the... The light thing. I'm trying to remember what the light thing. But basically, it says on the front of it that it's the free ballet performing that night. And so Sarah starts to become very anxious, and she lets him know that she can't go in. And after he kind of tries to understand why not, she just shrugs it off and says, okay, no, it's fine. We'll go in. And so they go in, they enjoy the ballet together, and I don't know if you notice this, like, he's one of the only black men in the audience. Yes. It was very apparent. Yep. <laughs> well, we get some beautiful shots of this ballet. Gorgeous. Um, yeah. And at the end of the performance, they're walking along the river, and Sarah obviously is just sad and melancholy. He's like, you know, I, I really thought you would have liked this. And she says, no, 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 I did like it. And he's like, well, you sure aren't showing it. <laughs> and this is where she has a complete meltdown. <laughs> understandable she was due for one <laughs> yeah <laughs> grief comes in so many forms like you have to let it out at some point <laughs> it's all over him <laughs> is what i'm gonna call that <laughs> so we learn that she holds a lot of guilt like an immense amount of guilt around her ballet and how she feels like it caused her mom's death and so he helps to break down the irrational thoughts that she's having you know like your mom just cared about you she really wanted to be there that's why she was rushing it wasn't because you made her promise it wasn't because you made her rush it's because she cared about you and she wanted you to live your dream and sarah's just like no i made her give up all of these things just so i could have the dream of being the prima ballerina 
uh, because I had to have it. And he asks her straight up, like, do you want Juilliard? Is this something that you want? And she says, yes. And he says to her, if you want Juilliard, you're the only one who's going to have to make that happen. So later on, he's walking her the rest of the way home. And she is very embarrassed about her freak out. As you know, I would be anytime I even have a moment of like panic. I'm just like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to show you that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm human and I have tears and I have water that comes out of my eyes. <laughs> and I have thoughts that, you know, sometimes creep up. <laughs> so she's very embarrassed about it, but he says it's all good. And basically they kiss goodnight. And it's a very nice kiss. <laughs> In terms of movie kisses, they they have very nice chemistry between them. <laughs> they do. That's one of those things where, like, when when actors have like, awkward kisses on screen, I'm just like, why, 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 why are we doing this? <laughs> when like, there's too much open mouth or tongue, <laughs> yes. I'm like, we're not in high school. We're not in middle school. <laughs> Technically, these guys are playing characters who are in high school, but still, they no they kiss very. This. So Sarah goes inside, and here we can see there's a turn in the plot because she goes to her closet and she pulls out her ballet shoes. So it's time to queue up another training montage. Mm -hmm. During their next dance session, Sarah tells Derek that she called Juilliard and that there's going to be auditions from Chicago the following month. And she explains to him that she's out of shape and that it hurts. I love his response to this because he's like, if this is out of shape, then what does it take to get you in shape? I know. I'm like, she looks like she's in incredible shape. <laughs> there's one thing to be in shape in general, and then there's another thing to be in shape for ballet. Sure. <laughs> that's a whole nother ball game. So she says that in order to get into shape, she has to continue practicing or start exercising, essentially. And so he makes a joke. He's like, okay, so you're going to do about 15 laps around, and you're going to push-ups and I'm going to sit here and watch. She tells him that she feels confident in her ballet. See her continue to train at an actual ballet studio with a ballet instructor and that he's going to need to help her with her free form because she has to do a ballet performance and then she also has to do a contemporary piece as well. Do you like when she started taking the classes my one of my only thoughts was, I wonder how they're paying for this. Because <laughs> we know those classes are probably not cheap. And based no. on where her father lives, he clearly does not make <laughs> a very good living. He's a jazz <laughs> performer. <laughs> I think he's a trumpeter. Yeah, he Sorry. plays the trumpet. Yeah, he plays a trumpet in a jazz band. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what they make. But yeah, the fact that that second room has been dilapidated for so long really doesn't provide a whole lot of, you know, confidence. <laughs> but yeah, I love the fact that while she's in her ballet class, Derek's just sitting yeah. along the wall. <laughs> yeah, he, he's just going and watching all of her practices, which is super sweet and cute. It is very sweet. <laughs> we cut back to steps. And Sarah the caterpillar has turned into Sarah the butterfly. So Sarah and Derek dance, and she starts to pull out some of the moves that they've been training on together. And a dance circle starts to form around them, and people are shouting, Go, Sarah! Go, Sarah! I think a couple of them say, Go, white girl! And just when this starts to happen, Mickey gets very jealous, and she's like, Watch me squash this and intervene. Which means she basically starts to grind all over Derek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this assets, literally. <laughs> Very much so. Assets and all. <laughs> she does a lot of front grinding. She does a lot of back grinding. She does a lot of, like, all the grinding. <laughs> side grinding, like, everything. <laughs> and this puts Derek into a complete stupor. Don't know where he went, but he, Derek, the intellectual, has left the building, if you will. He yeah, yeah. <laughs> is thinking with the other hand, if you think. So, obviously, Sarah exits the dance floor in jealousy. And after she's exited, she's watching the dance floor. 
And Malachi sees this, comes up to her, and inserts some narrative conflict. He specifically states, you'll never look as good as she does with him. That's oil in your milk. Which is a comparison I don't understand. <laughs> I've never heard that comparison before. Yeah. <laughs> I know water and, and oil, you know? I know milk and coffee or whatever, but I don't know milk and oil. I can't imagine anyone would have ever tried to mix the two. Oil and milk? Yeah. When you're baking, sometimes you'll put like oh, vegetable yeah. oil in it. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it still doesn't make any sense to me. I'm just like, yeah. okay. But right at this point, Derek comes up for air, essentially, yeah. <laughs> and realizes that Sarah has left the dance floor. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> Could it be that my dancing and grinding all over me? Nah. I can't. So. <laughs> He goes up to Zara, and she is giving him the straight silent treatment, turning over, making sure that he knows that she's watching him, but making sure that he knows that she's mad at him. But he does something that we don't see in a whole lot of movies. He actually apologizes. He's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. I would never try and hurt you. You know, me and Nikki have absolutely nothing moving forward. You're all I want, essentially, and I'm sorry. Which you don't hear too many men actually say, I'm sorry, in movies. So it was nice. It was nice. I agree. So she accepts his apology and then they head back to Sarah's place. So she lets him know that her dad will be gone all night, <laughs> which is very poignant <laughs> for what's about to happen because she puts on some music. They begin to make out. And I don't know how. Like she takes off his jacket and we see that. But suddenly the next scene, he is shirtless. <laughs> we don't know how this happened. Movie magic. <laughs> Movie magic. <laughs> this is all happening to a version of True Colors. And that's basically the end of it. We don't see anything beyond them making out with him shirtless in her living room slash bedroom. But <laughs> I know the living room slash bedroom. You better hope her father doesn't show up. Because you're just going to walk in the house and they're going to be there <laughs> there's not even a curtain up there's nothing there's something to hide under hide. <laughs> you start to hear the door unlock and you're just like oh it's too late. yeah <laughs> it's too late by that door point. Lock, it's too late <laughs> <laughs> later on Derek meets up with malachi and two of his goons at a diner and malachi asks Derek if he's going to the west side with them and Derek is no fool. He knows exactly what this means. And he says, hell no. And Malachi explains that, you know, that guy that he had a fight with at Steps, he needs to go out and protect his territory. He needs to retaliate. And he wants Derek there. He needs Derek there. And he tries to guilt Derek into joining by bringing up the past, by bringing up the fact that he took the cops on himself and didn't turn Derek in. So... We don't really see anything past that because we cut to school where the girls' gym class is playing basketball. And we see that Nikki and Sarah end up getting into a slap fight after a basketball hits Nikki in the head. And she's got some heat for Sarah already, so she just takes it out on her. And they just fight together. This is cut in between the, the guys playing street ball and Malachi, Malachi's rivals shooting up the group in a drive-by. Luckily, nobody's heard, but Malachi being back at the same time. I know this is terrible, but what a waste of a drive-by. There is a big group of men there. There is. Very large. And nobody got it. Like, how bad of a shot are you? You know what is funny about that is like, it made me think of something that Richard always says. Anytime that there's like a shooting scene in a movie and nobody hits anything, he's like, what is this, Star Wars? Seriously, nobody got hit. Nobody got hit. <laughs> um, so after class, Sarah and Nikki, Sarah, that Sarah's always getting up in her way. And it's not even just that. It's white women who are always taking their men. And Sarah gets a little defensive. She's like, 
we like each other. If you don't like that, screw you. So later that night, Derek goes over to Sarah's because he knows that they got into a fight to see the damage that's happened on her face. Because it is very apparent that she got into a fight. And right after she opens up the door, her dad shows up behind her and she's like, you need to go. Now's not the best time. I need you to leave, but I'll talk to you tomorrow. So her dad comes over with, I don't know what he did to this. He has a washcloth and he has a soft pan. I don't know what he did. <laughs> I was about to say, what did he do to that rag to make it stink? I don't what? know. <laughs> wow. But he says one of well, my favorite lines. And he says, yeah, but it's going to keep your face filling up like a pumpkin. <laughs> I really like the, like, her dad doesn't talk a whole lot in this movie, but I like the lines that he has most of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they crack me up. Well, so we cut back to Steps, and we see that Malachi and Derek are talking about the drive-by, and Malachi saying, you know, we need to retaliate. We need to retaliate. And he's asking Derek, you know, are you with me or not? And all of a sudden, Snooky and Sarah, who were presumably dancing on the dance floor, come and interrupt. And Malachi is pissed about this. He's not having any of it. Malachi kicks Snooky down to the ground, and trying to finish his conversation with Derek and he's trying to get them to go away but Sarah then asks Derek you know if he's ready to go because she wants to go home and Malachi tells her this is an A to B conversation see your way out and she replies to him fuck you at which point he lunges at her and Derek shoves him away then Malachi starts to pop off about how he needs to take his trailer trash girlfriend home. And Derek straight up punches him in the face to the point where he's bleeding. And you can feel the tension in the scene as Derek and Sarah head out and Malachi's just standing there stewing in what just happened. Such an angry little guy. Very <laughs> much so. Angry. Oh. I know. No. So later on, we cut to Derek and Chanel's apartment, and we hear Christopher coming, and we see that Kenny is trying to take Christopher for the weekend. And Chanel tells Kenny that he needs to come around more often if he doesn't want his son to be crying when he when he comes over. Kenny then screams at her because he's not happy with the fact that she keeps saying that she needs, you know, more funds to be able to take care of their son and that he needs to come over and, like, dogging on him, essentially. And she's like, nope, you're not going anywhere with my son with that attitude. And so Kenny leaves. So we got a lot of tension going on for this part of the movie. Is Kenny, did we yeah. ever find out if Kenny's in high school with them? Is this an older guy? I think he's an older guy, but I have no idea. It I mean, is, because I don't think we've seen him in high school. We have not. No, we just seen him at Stats. Are Chanel and Derek the same age? Is she older than him? I, feel, I don't feel like we really established that either. Hmm. Huh. You know what? We know that he is graduating high school. Sarah's graduating high school. Mm -hmm. I assume. Yeah. Chanel's also graduating high school, but I don't know. Maybe she's a year younger, but we don't establish ages, really. Except yeah. for Sarah. We know she's 17. <laughs> yep. She's the only one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good call out. But I do love the fact that Kenny is wearing a Pepsi-Cola jacket. <laughs> so we know he works for Pepsi-Cola. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Pepsi. <laughs> Oh, good for him. So later on, we cut to Chanel and Sarah in the doctor's office. She's trying to get Christopher to be seen by the doctor. And she goes up to the, the lady at the front desk and says, hey, I've been here for an hour and a half. My appointment was an hour ago. Is there any time that we're going to be able to see the doctor? And so then Chanel comes back to Sarah and tells her, you know, Nikki wasn't completely wrong about what she said. And her responds with, I don't understand. I thought you and I were friends. And Chanel says, you know, don't just be here to be here. Open up your pretty brown eyes and look around and look at the state of the world, essentially. And what it's like to be a white woman versus a black woman. And the life that we're in right now. 
So Sarah leaves <laughs> and having had Malachi tell her that her and Derek shouldn't be together, Nikki tell her that Derek shouldn't be together, Chanel tell her that her and Derek shouldn't be together, it's starting to get to her. Mm -hmm. At the next practice that her and Derek were having, Derek is saying, you know, hey, you gotta, you're missing that step. You're missing that step. Why are you fucking up your audition? This is for Juilliard. And she snaps back at him. She's like, okay, look, I'm, I'm distracted. I'm upset. Everything's so fucked out. And they get into a fight because he asks her, you know, have you picked out a dress for main squeeze night at steps? And she asks him, you know, cool it since I had that fight with Nikki. And he takes us to say, you don't want to be seen with me. You don't want to be with me. And so then they have a fight and come to the conclusion that maybe they shouldn't be together right now. And so they go their separate ways. <laughs> so at school, of all the outfits that Sarah, I don't know why this one works for me the most. Like, I love her hair and, like, the double braid with it kind of curled into loops, essentially. Um, I don't know why. Like, like the braids. Yes. Like, I'm sure that's, that's a poor villain movie. movie. Every hairstyle has been a braid. But, yeah, I do like the double braids. I think mm -hmm. that was really cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we're back at school. Sarah and Derek see each other in the hallways, but they're trying not to make eye contact. But they're clearly missing one another. And as Sarah walks past, that Derek is hanging out with Malachi, and he goes in to apologize. And Malachi says, no, it's totally cool. We're all past that. And he says, you know, do you have my back for Saturday? And Derek responds with, blood is thicker than blondes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but ultimately, he says, you know, he'll be there on Saturday. So we get some more scenes of Sarah practicing on her own now that her and Derek are no longer together. And she keeps making a few mistakes and struggling through the routine. And later on, she's at home, no longer at their makeshift dance studio. And she's at home reviewing some photos of her and her mom. And her dad comes into the scene and he wishes her luck for her audition the next day and asks if she's got a moment for her old man. He shows her the room, the dilapidated room that is no longer dilapidated. No, it looks nice. Oh, it's a very nice room. Oh, the door is fixed and everything. It's so funny too. It opens and closes now. <laughs> right? Without problem. <laughs> you would think what I think is hilarious is like the whole joke of this room is that one of the doors will not close because it's not hung right. And you would think that she would have noticed that the door was closed. Yeah. Apparently <laughs> not. Or maybe she just didn't care enough. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Probably both. Probably. But anyway, so he's put together in this room for her, and he's even included some old photos of her mom and talks about how he never really meant to mess up, like, her life or her mom's lives and tells Sarah that he doesn't deserve a second chance to be her father, but he's really hoping that she'll give him one. And he says, I hope that you don't hate me. And she responds with, I don't hate you. I just really miss her. And then she goes on to how much she misses her mom and how much this audition is going to be so hard for her because she really wants Derek there, but she knows that Derek is mad at her and that he's not going to be at her audition, but she needs him there. She really wants somebody there who's going to love her or that loves her. And her dad just responds perfectly, you know, I love you. And he just gently strokes her cheek a little bit. And it's a very tender moment between them. So then we cut to Derek and Chanel at a local park with Christopher. And they're going down the slide together. And Chanel says very hesitantly that she needs to tell him something. She told Sarah that she agreed with Nikki about white women and black men. And she doesn't know why, because she doesn't even like Nikki. But she was just tripping over Kenny. And... He's like, you said what? <laughs> so now things are starting to click for him. So he says that he needs to go and Chanel stops him and she's like, 
you know, I know what Malachi wants you to do. And you're much better than this. Why don't you just leave him alone? Like, he is not going to do anything good for you, essentially. But he says that he has to go, and he leaves, and she watches him as he runs past Kenny. So Kenny walks up to Chanel and Christopher and says, hey. Yeah. So they're, they're coming up on the good terms, apparently. Derek meets up with Malachi and the boys, and he tells them, I need to talk to you, I need to talk to you, come over here. But ultimately, he tells Malachi, you know, I'm not going with you. And he tries to convince Malachi, don't get in that car, just walk away, you're smart, I know you can do it. And Malachi's like, no, this is all I got. All I have is my respect, and I need to protect that. And so, ultimately, the ties are severed between Malachi and Derek, and Malachi goes on his drive-by, essentially. Meanwhile, Derek runs to the train. So we cut to Sarah and her dad going to her audition, and we see different views of Sarah getting to her audition, Derek running to her house, trying to find her there, but she's not there. Malachi and the guys in the car driving along the, the west side. And then Sarah doing her ballet audition and Derek running to it. We see a full scene of Malachi and the boys shooting up their rival, but then somebody shoots their tailpipe and causes the car to blow up and run into another car. We assume that all the men inside are badly injured, especially when we see that at least one of them is carted off in an ambulance and Malachi is arrested. Then we see a bit of Sarah's ballet routine while this is all happening. Derek finally makes it to the auditorium right after Sarah starts her freeform performance. She messes up, unfortunately, and she loses her balance. And she's very uneasy about it. She already thinks that she's failed. And she tells them, you know, I'm so sorry, I wasn't ready. And the head judge asks her, very annoyed, <laughs> might I add. He's like, are you ready yet, Miss Johnson? And she's not answering. But because Derek's in the auditorium, he says, yes, sir, she's ready. <laughs> and he runs up to the stage. <laughs> this part was almost annoying, honestly. Yeah, I feel like that would have ruined her chances. Uh -huh. <laughs> her getting in, not helping. <laughs> right? He's, like, talking to her, and he's trying to give her really good confidence. And he is. He's, he's there for her. He says, you know, nobody's watching but me. You know, she says the judge already hates her, and he lets her know, forget him. Just know that I'm watching you and dance for me. And after the judge has asked her if she's ready about 15,000 times, <laughs> she says, yes, sir, I'm ready. <laughs> So she goes and she restarts from the very beginning and Derek goes off to the side. I think it's stage right. And she goes to perform it one more time. We see her pass the spot where she messed up before and basically just knock it out of the ballpark. She's mixing up hip hop and ballet together. As she's dancing, the head judge is not very first, but the rest of the judges are head bopping along and really into it. She continues, and when she finishes, you know, she has this really satisfying, like, end to it, essentially. And she feels really good about it, and Derek is hollering along with her. It's just like, you know, if you guys don't let this girl in, y'all have lost your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Again, sir, not helping, but <laughs> appreciate it, but please stop. <laughs> That's what we all secretly want, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> We know the repercussions of that actually happening. <laughs> but the head judge tells her, you know, I can't say this on the record, but welcome to Juilliard. And Derek and Sarah hug off stage, and she's so excited. She couldn't even hardly believe it. We're back at Steps again, and it's main squeeze night. Sarah and, Sarah and Derek are there, and they run into Chanel who congratulates her and her and Chanel make up. And then we dance until the end credits. So does this pass the Bechdel test? I say it does. I say yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
even the conversation that Sarah and Chanel have about Chanel going off to design school and her complimenting her designs and Chanel introducing her to the other girls, you know, I'm pretty sure this passes. Yeah, I think it does too. Also, the very first opening lines pass. <laughs> yes, yes, they do, because they're talking about Juilliard. Her, yeah, they're talking about Juilliard and her dancing. Yeah, so mm-hmm. right from the get go, it passes. So, <laughs> so now. On to some trivia. So I had mentioned earlier that this has a lot of parallels to 10 Things I Hate About You. Mm -hmm. So Thomas Carter actually cast Julia Stiles because of seeing her in the role of Kat in 10 Things I Hate About You doing the table dance. What? (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that fun? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I love that scene. It forever stays with me, honestly. <laughs> while Julia Stiles says that she was in the best shape of her life while she filmed Say the Last Dance, she also said that she had calluses, bunions, and blisters on her feet, and that the dancing made her bleed all the time. So we do see a scene where she untapes her toes and they're bloody and stuff like that. I feel like that's probably what they actually look like during this. I feel like this. real. I feel like people <laughs> underestimate the amount of physical I can't think of the word, but there's like that ballerina yeah. still left my brain. But I mean, you think that you can yeah. Yeah. dance on your toes without any repercussions? No. You're kidding yourself. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So fun little bit of trivia about the club steps. All it's Seen as a hip hop nightclub here in this movie, it was actually filmed in a gothic club called the Crowbar. What is a gothic club? <laughs> I don't know really exactly what it sounds like, but I've, I've never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, basically, it's exactly what it sounds like, you know. Rather than Denver? playing. Like, are there any around here? Oh, I mean, I'm sure there are, but. <laughs> you know what? I need to look into that. I will let you know. <laughs> That sounds like something you would go to. I know. I have so many many people who will actually go dancing with me, and I'm not sure if anybody would go to a goth club with me. Is is, is a goth club somewhere you go dancing to? (laughs) I mean, yeah. Listen to goth music and you go dancing. There's um, an episode of Cranes with the lead singer of Bush where he's like... uh, He's a musician in this episode, but the episode actually opens up in a goth club. Is he considered goth? Or is that no. Bad? Bush? No, but no. for that episode, he was. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The lead singer. Okay. Yeah. I saw yeah. him in concert once, and I thought he was actually very attractive. Technically, <laughs> he's very attractive. Personality-wise, I can't say much for that. <laughs> I don't know anything about his personality. <laughs> can't comment on that, but... So, this movie made almost $28 million its opening weekend, and it's the largest opening that has ever occurred for Martin Luther King Jr. holiday weekend. Mm -hmm. And then the dance routine for Sarah's Juilliard audition was choreographed by Fatima Robinson, who choreographed for artists such as Michael Jackson, and a portion of the routine where Sarah uses the chair is similar to the chair routine from the Backstreet Boys, As Long As You Love Me music video. (laughs) Just bringing it back to all the early odds. (laughs) So... Fun story. During Derek and Sarah's first dance practice in the school cafeteria, the entire scene was completely improvised. So that fun little forth and about teaching her how to chill and how to walk, all hip hop was all completely improvised. And this was specifically by Sean Patrick Thomas's lead as the cameras caught him muttering instructions to Julia Stiles, even though she already knew how to dance. So... On her caffeine scale of one to five espresso shots, how stimulated did this movie keep us? One, we were falling asleep, or five, we were buzzing. I think this movie is a five. I think so, too. I Yeah. I enjoyed this movie. I, I love this movie. I, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it. I can't remember the last time I watched it, to be honest. <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's very entertaining. I, like I said at the beginning, I love this movie and I always have. I can watch this movie to the end of time and I will still always love this movie. I watched it three times in preparing for this. So, 
<laughs> and I love it every single time. <laughs> and it aged well as well. Uh-huh. That's something, something we can say a lot about a lot of, you know, early 2000s movies. Right, especially sure, early 2000s movies. <laughs> Uh, can I, I meant to ask you this so much earlier, but I wanted to ask you this question and feel free if you don't feel comfortable answering it, but I know that you are also by really by racial relationship where you're Latina and he, your fiance, Billy is white. So <laughs> you ever feel any of these kinds of tensions that were part of the movie, um, in your guys's relationship? No. Well, good. Honestly, I, I know that's a good thing. <laughs> it's not to say that that would never happen on certain other parts of our country. <laughs> I'm sure, but <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I've never experienced that. Honestly, well, good. Fortunately, which is good. Mm-hmm. Also, I think it helps because Arizona has such a high. I mean, we we border Mexico, so right. <laughs> We have such a high Latino, Latina population. So. Yeah, exactly. So I think some, at least that I personally have never experienced. Well, cool. Yay. Thank you for listening to another episode of Caffeinated Flicks. We're a self-published podcast produced and edited by Kenzie. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what films you'd like us to cover, what we can do better, or just say hi. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can follow us on Instagram at caffeinatedflixpod or email us at caffeinatedflix at gmail.com. We'll catch you on the flick side. So at school, <laughs> it's definitely not great. Um, now they I was laughing because like, I waited. And I was like, okay, cool. No commentary. And then I go into it and you're like, so sad. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's lagging or if that was just <laughs> really great. <laughs> no, it was just me. <laughs>